Hello, and welcome to episode number 242 of the LSR Podcast. My name is Matt Brown, joined each and every week by the brightest minds in all of the gaming industry with me. I'm back in the saddle with my main man here, Adam Candy. You can find him on the Twitter machine, Adam Candy, two E's, no Y. If you hate yourself, you can follow me at Matt Brown M2. If you haven't done so already, we are on all of your favorite podcasting platforms, so please go in, subscribe, rate, review. We do appreciate all of those little five stars. Helps us climb that chart and helps more people find this very podcast. We will talk about what went on over in Pennsylvania. We have an exciting little something exciting for you people over there. We have a sale in the industry we'll talk about. Adam just got back from a conference. We will talk to him about that. But Adam, let's kick things off here with what's uh, you know, it's kind of something it's been a theme here for us over the last two months, it seems like, of the podcast of Sportsbook's kind of assessing where they are and whether they need to continue on in the position that they have at least tried to take. And maybe that wasn't exactly where this all panned out as we sit here in July of 2024. Matt, we spend so much time on this podcast talking about the money-making opportunity of NFL and college football betting, right? That is the prime season for customer acquisition. It is the prime season for for trying to take those customers and get more and more betting volume from them as you go along. What we don't spend as much time talking about is how much it costs to do that. Because it's not like you just turn the spigot on at the beginning of football season and everyone comes running in the door to bet with you when there's a lot of competition. And so right now, here we stand in late July as a number of companies have said, do we want to go another football season? Do we want to incur the marketing expenses? Do we want to go through this again and not know that we can really compete? This time, we're talking about Superbook, and that is interesting to me because of the brand that Superbook started with. There were very few, Matt, very few established brands Mm -hmm. in sports betting that tried to make a go of this. And when I talk about sports betting, I mean sports betting in particular, not casino like MGM and Caesars, not DFS like DraftKings and FanDuel, but a company like Superbook where everyone knows the Westgate Superbook and before that the Hilton Superbook and everyone knows about the Super Contest. It's one of those things that gets talked about in mainstream media and has been for a number of years. And when you go to Las Vegas, the discussion is always like, oh, where are you going to hit if you're a sports better? Superbook is generally one of your stops if you are someone who cares about sports betting, if only to see the setup that they have down there. Well, we know that first under Superbook USA and then later just under the Superbook brand, they tried to go big. They, they were near double digits in states and they never really made much of an impact. Um, the Superbook brand did not resonate outside mm-hmm. of Nevada. It, it was not marketed all that strongly And Matt, I think there was also something that the Wire Act really did to shut them down more than other sports books. We talk all about exchanges and liquidity and the ability to work across state lines. Well, the super contest doesn't work if you have to run it in each state, right? It's not the same. You don't have the same buzz running the Tennessee super book Mm -hmm. super contest that you do from being in the Vegas-based one. Could they have tried to do it? Potentially, I think it would have been interesting to see if they could have done some state-based ones, but I just don't think it would have had the juice that others did. So what we got was basically an announcement on July 19th, like, hey, outside of Nevada, we're done. Like, you can come get your money. That's going to be the end of it. Uh, Superbook never cracked anything above half a percent in market share anywhere, and even that would have been on the high end for them. Took them a while to get their New Jersey licensing situation Uh, squared away. They tried to compete in a number of other states and never really got any sort of attention for it. And so they will continue to be in Nevada. They'll continue to run the Super Contest in Las Vegas. I'm sure Jay Cornegay and company will still have the loyal following that they do in Las Vegas. But in terms of trying to make it farther than that across the country, they're done there. Specific to Ohio, Betfred uh, decided to pull out from there. It's the second Betfred pullout that we've seen Recently, another brand that uh, we're not really sure what the future looks like for them in the U.S. market. But, Matt, it's the Superbook one that I thought was really interesting in terms of the idea that you could just take what worked in Las Vegas and transport it to the rest of the country, and that did not work. Yeah, I 
So having gone to a couple of different states in which Superbook was active and going in and taking a look at what they had going on there, Adam, it's kind of the deal where we've talked about what differentiates you from everybody else. And the thing is, is I think they were trying to play in both sandboxes and I just don't think that works. Whereas you've got Circa who comes in and is just like, hey, we ain't giving you no bonuses and we're not whatever, but we'll take your big bets and we're going to probably have a better line than everybody else out there. And that is our shtick. And that is what our, that is what we're doing. And that is what our brand is. And that is how we're going to get a following. And that is how we're going to get customers. Superbook, if you know, in Vegas, will take bigger bets, um, not as big as Circa, but they will take some some bigger bets. Than that. But Adam, they also wanted to play in the deposit bonus stuff and they also wanted to play in the in the in the boost market and they wanted to play in that as well which is a little confusing, I think, to a better from a brand identity standpoint, right? It's like, well, it's a boost, but it's not as good as I can get at FanDuel and DraftKings. It's a it's a deposit bonus, but it's not as good as I can get at MGM or get it whatever. And so it was, I just don't know. I think that maybe they should have just come in maybe more with the Derek Stevens and, and Jeff Benson approach over there at Circa and just be like, hey, you're not going to get all the, the, the bells and whistles that you get these other places, but we'll take bigger bets. We're going to try to give you better lines. We're going to do the best we can to come in and give you some some options that maybe you don't get at other places and, and stuff like that. But I, I just, I don't think it ever really panned out. And, you know, again, right or wrong, you and I have, have talked about that approach with Circa, like the no bonus approach, the, the no boost approach, the no whatever. And is that sustainable long term? But at least they have a strategy, right? I mean, like that is that is what they're doing, and that is their strategy, and that's how they're going to approach these these markets. And I don't know if Superbook really came in with an established. This is what we're going to be, and this is how we're going to get a, a customer base. It was kind of like ah, oh, one toe in here, and then one toe in here, and then one toe in here. And as we well know, that's that's kind of tough. Well, I want to take your last point first, and then get back to the idea of brand identity mm. for Superbook. Uh, you can do what Circa does if you have a very rich guy who doesn't care behind it. And that's what you have with Derek Stevens. You have a very wealthy man who wants to do it this way. Mm -hmm. And so Derek Stevens cares a lot about his sports book and how that fits into his operation and how that has begat the stadium swim experience from which mm -hmm. we know that Circa prints money from people being able to go to the day club, nightclub yeah. experience centered around sports. It has been a very good gateway for them, but that is something that you can only do if you have ownership that is willing to ride the wave of what goes along with that. If you're taking big bets and you're taking respected action, you're probably not clearing huge margins month after month, or you're having a really good month and then a really bad month. And it's the sort of thing that doesn't work as well with the public markets as it does with an owner who's willing to go along with that. Now, Adam, one, 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 yeah. one quick thing I forgot to mention that I want your opinion on as well in this is you, you mentioned the super contest where that's another thing Circa did. I mean, it came in and they marketed the hell out of their contests and the things that they were doing. And it kind of made the super contest like the, the second tier, right? It was like the JV. And, it, and so the thing that super, that, that like super book had, became kind of like the second tier one. You know, it was like, no, everyone's playing Circa Millions. Everyone's think playing so? the Circa Survivor. Yeah, I mean. Really, you, you, you think it was second tier? I don't, know if, I don't know that that was the vibe I got that it was second tier, but I do well, think Well, you can see Circa the numbers. I'll just put it that way. I mean, like, yeah. there, there, was, there, was, there, was, there was thousands and thousands of less entrants. So, I mean, you know, I, right, I guess but that's I think why the, I'm going. Well, I think the point of that also goes along with this. Circa Survivor was its own thing, too, right? Like, coming in with Circa Survivor was brand new, and I think you probably saw that, there is a limited pool of people who are willing to play at the dollar level that goes along with that. And I also believe if you're talking about the fact that you have to play at a certain dollar level and you're talking about thousand, two thousand dollar entries into these contests, that those betters who are willing to play at that level are probably the betters who were going to be open to the idea of going to Circa in the first place when you start playing at that level. They're kind of people who would be courted away from a place like Westgate. Now, beyond that. I think what you saw is that they didn't use Westgate, their number one asset. The, the Super Contest was their number one asset, is still their number one asset when it comes to marketing that sports book. It's the thing everybody knows. You could have gone to these other states and tried to recreate it in some way. Now, because of the Wire Act and the inability to play essentially across state lines, it would have been impossible for them to do it in a way 
that put that liquidity for the entire country Mm -hmm. together. But when it comes to brand identity and the failure to do that and the deposit bonuses, as you talked about and so on, the folks that I talked to early on were a bit concerned about what the voices were in their ears uh, in this on the Superbook side in terms of Mm -hmm. taking the Vegas approach and were they going to use a more national approach? And you're talking about guys, Jay Cornegate, John Murray and so on. They know how to run a book like you're not going to tell them anything about how to run a book, but they've never had to do the part of going to compete nationally against these brands, throwing hundreds of millions of dollars into their marketing, into tech products that are far and away ahead of what anything Superbook or any other Nevada based book had to offer. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, I, I, it, I hate it. I hate to see it. Obviously we, we, always preach that the more competition out there, the better, the more options for the better, the better, all of that. But it's, it's tough. It's going to be, it's going to be hard. And this won't be the last one. We'll continue, you know, talking about these guys that decide that the juice isn't worth the squeeze uh, as we continue on. But one is actually going the other direction here in this second story, Adam, we knew if, if we're talking about, you know, money in the coffers, we know the money is in the coffers here. It was just a little bit of a delayed reaction as to how they wanted to roll it out, what the strategy was going to be. And I think that maybe at the end of the day, maybe they went about it the right way for what they're trying to do is let everybody else fight and fight and fight and fight. And they're going to sit there and blow through tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. And then we kind of come in and do our thing in wave number two. I'm talking about bet 365. So the question with 365 is this, what is the goal? What do they really want? And Part of the answer to that question goes back to what we just talked about with Circa. If you have ownership wealthy enough to just kind of ride it out, you can play it any way you want. It doesn't ultimately matter whether you decide to jump in, throw a bunch of money at it, or decide to wait until later. But what comes with that is, what are you willing to accept as success? Because it's going to be very difficult at this point for 365 to get to a DraftKings or FanDuel level of where they are right now. Uh, That being said, could 365 end up as the number three operator in this country? Without question. Mm-hmm. We've seen it in their early results in Ohio when they came in and were offering some big bonuses that they were charting up at the top in the first year in Ohio. What we see now is that they're launching both their sports betting and their iGaming product in Pennsylvania. And that is, of course, one of the more lucrative markets in the country if you can get it going especially because of the fact that you have iGaming to offer that is the big differentiator for a number of companies in terms of their ability to ride this out long term so now 365 is in in that state we will see what they do in terms of promotional strategy if they decide to go about it similar to the way they went about things in Ohio but in an environment where we keep talking so much about who's not going to be doing this anymore slowly and steadily we see 365 approaching its rollout in the United States. And again, it's a company that was not in any way dependent upon success in the United States for it to survive, for it to thrive. That's not what they need. They are one of the most successful gaming operators in the world at this point. They can take whatever approach they want with the U.S. market and slow and steady appears to be the way they're going. Yeah, I look at... I look at Bet365 and, you know, it's the, like I said, they've, if they want to kind of just slowly roll it into whatever, will there ever be widespread online poker in the United States? Who knows? But if there is, they've got a poker product. Will there ever be widespread iCasino in the United States? We think there will be at some point, Adam, but like we can't say for certain. But if there is, they can roll that out. We know they have a really good sports betting product. There's like a lot going on. With them that like, you know, there it's much easier for them to just turn something on than it is for a lot of the other people out there. And you've mentioned the not only the money, but look, the experience. This is a company that has been around for twenty five years now. You know, I think it was ninety nine if I remember when three six five really got got going and everything. So I mean it's a, it's they have twenty five years of experience, twenty five years of figuring out how to do this and and you know, it's it's if they wanted to do poker down the line if they would they could if they want to do i can see it over there they could there's uh, it's almost possibilities endless true the one thing i would keep an eye on when it comes to watching i'm not gonna say parallel paths but certainly paths that could have an effect on each other 
Just keep an eye on what happens with gambling reform in the UK. It's still an ongoing discussion as to what ultimately happens there. That could have some effect on what we see 365 do rest of world. Uh, it's not just about the United States, of course. There are hot new markets like Brazil. There's a lot that's happening worldwide right now when it comes to gambling. And because 365 has such an enormous reach that you will see interconnected parts have effects on the other. But for now, brand new state in Pennsylvania and what is likely not to be a cheap launch to have to go out there and compete in an established market in Pennsylvania. Quick note here of stuff going on in the industry. Adam DraftKings acquired VEASAN uh, about three and a half, four years ago. Uh, the Vegas Asset Information Network was founded by Brent Musburger and his family. Uh, that was looked at as a marketing arm for the company. And then they decided to go a different direction with the DraftKings network. They cut deals with, you know, the Levitard group. They cut deals with the Golix, all the smoke, all the things like that. Not really, not really what it seemed like was sports betting based content, more just general sports entertainment type stuff. And it seems like that was the model they wanted to move with forward. Press release said kind of as much, which was they're going to move forward with the DraftKings network, but it's going to be focused more on kind of how their vision is of moving forward with programming and things like that. Just kind of reading into the lot, you know, just reading into things, Adam, seems to me like they're prefer the more general sports approach and thinking that they are going to turn, you know, the general guy who stumbles on to sports programming XYZ that they have bought rights to and turn those guys into sports bettors as to people who are listening to really kind of hardcore sports betting talk. Um, I don't know what the right, uh, right approach is one way or another. I'm sure they will find out as uh, the years go by with all of that, but VEASAN sold back to the original owners. So full disclosure, as we get into this story, uh, Matt has been for a number of years, a prominent voice uh, on VEASAN. I've done some work for VEASAN in the past as well. So we know a little bit about the history here and, and where this has gone. Um, when this came down that DraftKings was selling VEASAN back to its original owners, I wasn't terribly surprised because of the fact that you look elsewhere with the idea of, we'll put this in air quotes, the media model for making sports betting work. Um, it's not happening right now. And it hasn't happened very well for a number of companies. It, we've seen it tried in a couple of places where you put some branding of a media company and you hope to be able to attach to sports fans and be able to bring them along. And it just hasn't worked out that way. Now, VEASAN's a little bit different because you had a different type of, of audience right you had a more betting focused audience that was already part of that but i think part of the deal when you when you look into that if you're DraftKings as a sports book buying into that my question to DraftKings would have been this who is it that is watching or listening to vsin who isn't already aware of your product and who hasn't already considered your product alongside all of the other legal and illegal betting market options the VEASAN customer is a savvy customer you have to really want to listen to that product right it's yeah. not something that is that is out there doing what a DraftKings network is doing there is no Pablo Torre finds out on VEASAN right I mean frankly I can you know we can both tell you from the inside if you ever got too far toward that you know entertainment type content on VEASAN in my experience, the powers that be would rein you in and say, hey, we need to know who we're talking to here. We need to be focused on the better. We need to be focused on actionable information. And so that, to me, always struck me a little bit strangely in terms of that deal. We know that DraftKings originally paid uh, $70 million to acquire VEASAN. We do not have the terms on the sale back uh, as of yet, but it'd be interesting to see uh, which way... VEASAN decides to go with this because even when it was part of DraftKings, they were taking advertising you know, from some other sports books. DraftKings said it will continue to advertise with VEASAN. Uh, we know that at the time, VEASAN's operations first were out of the South Point, then they were kind of split between South Point and Circa. They've now moved everything down uh, towards Circa. And Matt, I, I've always wondered, with as much investment as Derek Stevens has put into building a studio for VEASAN, wanting to cater to the very savvy and smart sports better. I've always wondered whether or not Derek Stevens would have an interest in owning it at some point. And I, I, that 
that becomes even more of a question for me now that Brian Musburger and Billy Eddie are back in charge. Yeah, I have no inside information on on anything with any of it. And, and listen, I had a good time w- under the DraftKings umbrella. I thought it was uh, you know a, a pretty good company with everything all said and done. Um, I, I will say this: I always thought that what they used Veasan for, for me personally, like I let's if I took a step back and I was just an advisor as opposed to someone who was actually within the the umbrella. Visa to me should have been a an action driver, a retention company, a re-up company, not an acquisition company for all the reasons that you mentioned, right? Where it's like if you're if you're listening to Visa and stuff, if you're listening to me talk for an hour about an NFL, about NFL stuff and everything like that, like you probably got a sports book account or you probably got most sports books accounts already, right? It sh- I thought Visa should have been used for hey check out this specific bet you should go use you should bet this bet now or hey you uh you busted your account unfortunately last football season here's a re-up bonus you know like here's a redeposit bonus type deal here's a, you know like i always thought decent should have been used for that you're talking to sports bettors as it is anyway so give sports bettors who are already betting sports what they want like give them a a bet to make like here's a, you know here's whatever here give them a a deposit a, a even a re-up bonus, like, you know, not even like you had to have your account busted. Who, who cares? If you got, if you still have $2,000 in your account, here's a, you know, here's a code. To, if you want to put in $100 more, we'll give you $100. It's, you know, things like that. I always thought it was, should have been used more like that, right? A, a, a bet driver, a, a re-up, a retention, a, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff like that as far as that goes. But, you know, again, I don't, but my pay grade stuff that uh, was, was way out of everything for me. So, um, yeah, VEASAN just kind of gets back to it, its roots as, uh, as a, just a, a, a content company about all things sports betting. I imagine, like you mentioned, Adam, there will be relationships with companies that you probably hadn't seen in a while and all that. I can only imagine because I assume that's going to be in the in the vision and the grand plan with everything hey you did get to go to some cool places though didn't you yeah yeah so there's all yeah there's you got to you 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 got to see some cool you got to see some cool uh dk properties uh over over time i hey i actually uh believe it or not uh i and we're gonna talk about nickel g's in a moment Mm -hmm. here uh the back of that trip i was in chicago got to go to wrigley field for the first time and got to see the DraftKings sportsbook uh facility at wrigley field that thing is massive. Like, I was surprised at, uh, you know, I mean, it looks beautiful on the inside, but uh, the, the size of it was really what uh, what got me. I mean, literally built into Wrigley Field. You and I missed each other by mere hours over mere hours. in Chicago. By the way, just uh, as an aside, it'll only take 30 seconds. Shout out to everybody that had to travel over the last week. Uh, and if anyone working behind the counter at the airport's I feel very sorry for you. I know you have nothing. You, there's nothing you can do. I know. And everyone wants to scream at you and be mad at you and all that. I, I feel so bad for all of you out there having to deal with people who can't rationally process that you can't fix a computer. Like, you know, it's not your job. You are not an IT person and whatever. So uh, shout out to all those people. Oh, absolutely. And and let me just toot my own horn here for a second. You ready for this? Yeah. Oh, Southwest, you remember when you stranded me in the Vegas airport <laughs> over Christmas a couple years back? You remember that? I'm sure you do. You remember when your whole system melted down? Well, guess what, baby? I was on Southwest this time, and because they're working off an old Commodore 64, <laughs> none of us got stranded. We all there made go, our buddy. flights. Good yeah. on you, Southwest. There you go. You're just flying on through there, Adam. All right, but you just mentioned it. So uh, you you just got back from conference over there on the uh, on the East Coast. So uh, tell us tell us what uh, you found over at Nickel G's. Yeah, very uh, very interesting conference this time. We know that uh, the National Council of Legislators from Gaming States, Nickel G's, hosts two conferences a year. This one was in Pittsburgh, uh, oh. so we were of course yeah. in a legal sports betting state, uh, mm-hmm. being in Pennsylvania and. I thought the content was interesting from this perspective. There was talk of the new verticals of of sweeps and and casino and a little bit of uh, DFS plus flex 2.0, wherever you want to call it. The uh, the prize picks and underdog folks were out in force at this conference. But one of the notable panels that got a lot of attention was Billy Walters and uh, the guy known on Twitter as Spanky, professional better, uh, they were kind of soft launching something that came out this week called American Better's Voice, where they're attempting to, as they say, get a seat at the table 
for the voice of the better. Now, you could bring up some reasonable discussion as to who the better is that they're representing. I mean, you're talking about a couple of guys with some significant coin where if you go to their website for the American Better's Voice, they want you to pay $100 a year to, to join the organization. I, I might say they've got plenty of money to just sign people up and let them be a part of it without having to pay $100 a year. But the idea was they had a sit-down with Billy, with uh, Spanky, with Richard Schutz, the uh, veteran casino legislator at the conference, and some very, some very interesting discussion about what the life of someone who operates at the level of a Billy Walters is like. Now, mm -hmm. we know that Billy Walters ran into some trouble uh, legally, did some time in prison. Uh, we know that Spanky's currently tied up in the lawsuit situation uh, involving bearding that we talked about extensively mm -hmm. on this podcast. But to me, the fact that Sean Fluherty, the delegate from West Virginia, who is currently the president of Nickel G's, is someone who understands the industry a bit, was involved in getting those industries of sports betting and iGaming going in West Virginia. And bringing those guys in, I thought, showed that we're entering a level of sophistication with the discussions around sports betting when it comes to legislators that I thought was intriguing to see. Now, keep in mind, with Nickel G's, you have a lot of new legislators coming in. You're kind of constantly churning through folks who want to come and learn about do they want to work on gaming legislation in their state. Mm -hmm. And that's what this conference is really there to do, to build networking, to give them education, to let them learn from some people who've done it before. So that being said, there was that level of, you know, I would say more 101 discussion, but it's more 303 and 404 when you start getting into right. talking to professional betters. So that was one thing. Um, I'll pause there and let you weigh in on that part because the second part that I want to bring up is a little more related to iGaming and I thought it was uh, an interesting discussion brought up by a legislator from Maryland. Yeah, I, you know, it's kind of one of those things, Adam, where I've seen this happen in the other deals too. Like, you know, there's, there was, you know, there was like the, the Poker Players Alliance like back in the day and for poker players and then I know they tried to do something with the DFS and things like that. I think it's fine. And like, listen, people want to be a part of groups. And honestly, at the end of the day, it ends up being more of just a social thing anyway, right? It's like, it's a reason for everyone to get together once a time, once a year. I'm sure there'll be some in-person meeting or so, you know, it, I, I don't know how strong the voice really will be specifically in sports betting for so like it's different in poker and maybe it's different even in, in DFS, right? Because the high volume guys really do put in a massive amount of, the fuel into the fire for, for those, for those sites. Right. I mean, like high volume poker players, high volume DFS players are super coveted because those dudes are really and truly a bigger portion of the, of the pie than most people realize in sports betting. We already know this. I already know like the 1% is like just not. Yeah. I mean, they are, they're making the big bets, but as we always talk about, they're probably winning the big bets more often too. You know, it's like, it's like, it's just that we all, we know you, the 99% is going to get catered to. I, 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 I hate it. You hate it. We want to see it equalized a little bit more, and we want everyone to have a, a, a fair shake in all of this. But I just don't know from a business perspective, specifically with a lot of these tax rates that they're paying in other places, and uh, as much as it costs to get going, you've talked about the marketing expenses that it takes to keep these things going. It's not even – how about the, the initial rate to get going in a lot of these states? You're paying $10 million to get going in Pennsylvania whenever this thing all started. Like, you're $10 million in the hole from day one. And all, so it's just, I just don't know how you don't cater to the 99% when it all comes down to it. And a lot of the talk, Matt, was about 1% issues, right? They want transparency in pricing. They want transparency in limits. And we have spent a lot of podcast breath – talking about both of those issues. We don't need to get into it now more. You know where we stand on all of those things. It's not simple to solve that stuff. And if they want to have part of the discussion, that's fine. But I also think it's important to understand who's talking to you, right? And I think it's important to understand that Billy Walters is one of the most successful gamblers of all time. Yeah. But we have to talk about people in totality, correct? Right? We have to talk about the fact that Billy Walters is a convicted felon for insider trading. And so there is a level there at which you have to understand not only the message, but the messenger. Now, 
a guy like Richard, who is working with them, is a highly respected uh, regulator, a guy that I enjoy talking to uh, at the conference. Uh, Spanky, I don't think there are a lot of folks who have neutral opinions on Spanky, right? You kind of either fall on the side where you're in his camp or, or you're against him, and a lot of that is fostered online by the discussion that happens there. So just another interesting nuance to, to that part of how we talk about this. Now, I thought that Ron Watson from Maryland talking about iGaming only did it for about 15 minutes. Sean Flaherty brought him up at the end of a panel to have this discussion about what did you learn from trying to get an iGaming discussion going in Maryland and what if, will you try to apply next year? And man, he gave one of the most succinct, intelligent, nuanced sets of thoughts on this that I've heard. And I thought the really interesting part that uh, what Mr. Watson talked about mm -hmm. was you have to have a team. You can't just drop a bill and think that it's all going to come together. You have to do education. You have to have all of your people lined up before you do this. And when I say all of your people, I mean all of the people who would have an interest in where this goes, including the land-based casinos, including which operators would be coming in to run the iGaming product. Most importantly, maybe, when it comes to the legislative process, you have to have your legislators and your executive branch people singing from the same songbook on not only what the tax rate is, but where the money is going to go because it doesn't take much to derail it. And we saw it in Maryland this time where not the small casinos, not the major players, but right there kind of in the middle with, with live where they brought in the unions and the unions bust in people and talked about how they were all going to lose their jobs if iGaming came around because of people not playing in the casino anymore. And whether that is true or not, we've been on record talking about how cannibalization fears are overstated, but that's something that legislators are going yeah. to listen to. They've got constituents standing right in front of them telling them don't do this, and in a lot of them. And that union presence was a big reason why that bill ultimately didn't get as far as they needed it to go. So I thought that was very, very savvy discussion from uh, from Mr. Watson about what he learned and how he'll bring iGaming back next time. And it was great information, I thought, for anybody who's going to try to drop that bill in their own state to say, listen, this is not something that you can throw out there without having all of your ducks in a row before you do it. You can't just throw the bill out there and say, well, let's start a discussion. Because that discussion will be started for you and likely ended for you by other people. Adam, we've got to put a bow on this. What was the best beer you had while you were there? Oh, boy. Well, at the game, you know, you're at the Pittsburgh Pirates game, which we were able mm -hmm. to attend. That's that's icy light territory, right? Like mm -hmm. the, you're supposed to do that. Now, I don't get to go to the, to the East Coast very often, so... I don't see Yingling very often, so when I get a chance to get my hands on on a Yingling, I get I get kind of excited. I I enjoy that. Yeah. Um, and it you know, was old style, right? Well, that's the thing. You you beat me to the punch there. I was just gonna say, first time at Wrigley, an absolutely perfect summer night. I <laughs> lucked out and was able to get a really good ticket, tenth row behind home plate for oh. far less. Far far less than what you would think I would have paid for this ticket. Look at that humble brag um, right there. I love it. I love oh. That. Uh, I'll tell you straight out, 150 bucks. Like, like the ticket was <laughs> the ticket was 100 yeah. percent worth it. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. But if when I sat down with my old style and my hot dog at Wrigley Field on a perfect summer night, that instantly mm. became the best beer just because of where I was. That's I, I like I like hearing that. I uh, I'm not a beer guy myself, but I did have me I had me an old style whenever I was in, in Chicago. Yeah, it just it I'll was one it. of those things. Yeah, I just I I just did. I, I can't help it. Guys, everything we talk about, you can go over to LegalSportsReport.com and you can find all the written words Adam and team are putting together over there. If you found us on YouTube, hello. And uh, if you haven't gone to that yet, head on over to our YouTube page and give us a follow over there as well. For Adam, I'm Matt. Talk to you guys next week. <laughs>